Today is Tuesday at CTN Live, 11 a.m. Uh, session, and we have uh, Dominic Domingo coming up. His title of his show or his presentation is Creating a Rockstar Portfolio. So I'm going to unshare my uh, slate, and here is Dominic. Good morning, <clears throat> or wherever, depending where in the world you are. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, don't know. Um, this is a larger group, just so you know. You know, I've done this portfolio workshop at CTN X for literally 12 years. I was just looking at my notes, and I think that, you know, I've been on board with CTN X uh, convention since day one, and I think it's been like 12 years. But um, this portfolio workshop, I've done it for I think at least since 2012, but never to this large of a group. So I'm honored. I'm honored that everybody's here. And um, I'm again, want to thank Tina for following through and doing an event like this. I think it's so important that we artists continue to inspire one another and support one another. And, um, you know, uh, even just as humans, not, not just as artists. So thank you, Tina. Thank you, CTN. And thank you, um, everybody that's, oh, volunteering. I just lost my connection. Uh-oh. Well, in that meantime, when you're putting things together, uh, this is- I mean, No, I lost- Moderator. I have just one announcement to make that I forgot. Never and that is, uh, if you do have questions during uh, Dominic's um, presentation, please enter it in the chat because you will be answering questions as we go. Okay. I, I'm back. So anyway, welcome everybody. I don't want to spend any more time on that. I will tell you a little bit about who I am because I think you deserve to know who's giving you advice and, uh, uh, but that'll come up as we go. So the very, the way I'd like to start this is ask you, and you can chime in in the chat, by the way, there's going to be a moment here or there where we might field questions if they're relevant to the group. Uh, and then at the very end, there's definitely going to be a Q&A. If it runs over, we can just keep going. It's fine because there's a little bit of a break between this and the next presentation. So anyway, the way, and please do chime in in the chat. The way I like to start this is, what is a good portfolio? You know, we've all heard myths about, you know, do this, don't do that, and conventional wisdoms and sort of conventions about, you know, a great portfolio. My question is, if you agree that there's no right or wrong in art, you know, God knows we can't even define beauty or art or literary value or artistic integrity, those things are pretty evasive. So if there's no right or wrong in art and there's just cause and effect, then what makes a good portfolio? So that's for you to think about. Feel free to chime in. What is a good portfolio? I'm gently offering that art is indeed subjective. So there can be a consensus among a group. Let's say you're being reviewed at CTN by sort of a panel, and I've participated in a lot of those panels. Uh, if they're all from the same sort of format and genre, let's say a bunch of my feature animation peers are reviewing your portfolio as a panel. Not TV animation, not gaming, not any other genre or format, just feature animation people. We tend to share sensibilities, we share a background for sure. So our aesthetic sensibilities and then what we, sorry, there's a uh, construction going on. What we look for in a portfolio might sort of settle into consensus because our agenda is the same. The lens through which we're viewing it can be the same. But nine times out of 10, you will be receiving, I don't know, different worldviews, different sensibilities, and the best way I can put this is I, I taught the portfolio class for six years at Art Center, my alma mater. So again, I'll go into my background a little bit in a minute, but I worked at Disney for 11 years and now I've been gone for, I think, over 20. Uh, in that time, I've worked in every conceivable uh, uh, sort of sub genre of entertainment. I've worked in gaming, I've worked in television animation, feature animation, publishing, uh, so uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from. I, I have a broad cross section of sensibilities and you know, I've reviewed portfolios uh, working in Jerusalem. So I've seen you know, portfolios, a cross section of portfolios from the world over. When I worked for Disney in Paris, I saw the typical European portfolio that's coming out of more academic atelier type programs in uh, 
Europe? So I'm coming from sort of a broadened perspective on this. But what I wanna get to is even, okay, so at Art Center where I taught the portfolio class, we had, you know, what are called on-campus interviews, recruiting for the grad students when they're ready to hit the pavement and go out into the real big bad world, we have what's called um, on-campus interviews. And that's gone on since I was there a million years ago, 89 to 91. And now um, I've taught there for over 20 years. I sort of founded their entertainment track. So more recently, we've transitioned into what's called, I jokingly call it speed dating. It's where you have all the recruiters sort of sitting around the cafe. At around the cafe. Okay. Anyway, we jokingly call it speed dating and it's where all the recruiters, whether it's gaming or TV animation or feature animation doesn't matter, but they're all sort of sitting. Okay, I can't have that. Sitting around and you're obligated. And you're obligated to visit every single recruiter. So what happens inevitably is students who may be rather green and not used to receiving feedback um, are sort of baffled because the recruiter at a given company may not qualify their feedback. You know, to be honest, some of these recruiters may not even be that experienced at reviewing portfolios. And for the, you know, as a consequence, they may not even have a bedside manner. But more to the point, they don't qualify their feedback with, for our purposes, at our company, given the product that we produce, you may need A, B, C, and D to be a candidate. Students walk away thinking, oh my God, I suck. I need more plain air painting. I need more still lives. I need more academic figure painting. And they take it as very black and white, if that makes sense. So just know that, that very few people who are reviewing your work will qualify it by saying for our purposes at this company, in order to consider you as a candidate, this is what we need to see. They might just say it as a blanket statement. You need more of this, you need more of that. Happens every day. Now I wanna, again, go back to that scenario where maybe you see a bunch of visual development artists, a very specific cog in that enormous machine that is production, all visual development artists. And that's exactly what you wanna do. You wanna be a visual development generalist. Even that group might differ, of course, but when you sift through the feedback, nine times out of 10, the, the basic tenets are the same and you have to consider the wording of it, the semantics, the perspective, the context. So where does the consensus lie? If you have nine out of 10 visual development artists giving like, let's give it a numerical, you know, uh, giving a certain score to a portfolio in terms of their assessment and the needs for that particular niche in production, what accounts for that consensus? So <clears throat> the way I put it, <clears throat> so sorry, <clears throat> is of course, academic proficiency. And I hope that means something straight out the gate, but that could be <clears throat> when you're looking at figure drawings, plain air paintings, still lives, it's very easy to assess, you know, draftsmanship ability when it comes to painting. It's very easy to, for most of us to look at a plain air painting and go, wow, that person has mastered Chevrolet's laws of simultaneous contrast. They really know warm cooler relationships. Uh, they really know value structure. Um, they, they really know, um, I don't know, the, the importance of correlating light and shadow with warm and cool. It's, it's quite easy for trained artists to assess the academic proficiency is the way I put it. And then when it comes to what I call the more inventive work, the more narrative work that requires imagination and uh, innovation, and you're drawing on all that academic ability, it has to be evident in your invented designs as well. So I know this is not anything new to you, but maybe think about even if it's unexamined on the part of the portfolio reviewers or the panel, perhaps there is this sort of confluence of ac apparent academic uh, uh, proficiency, even in the invented designs with what I'm calling a strong authentic voice. <clears throat> so I'm gonna define that a little bit. What is voice? 
I personally um, distinguish between voice and style. And you can think about that for yourself, but style can be rather superficial. Style can be per project. You know, I worked at Disney on Lion King, Pocahontas, Hunchback, Tarzan, Little Match Girl, and One by One. And each one of those, even though Disney has a very distinct brand and stockholders to please, and the public actually kind of freaks out if we um, stray too far from the traditional brand that is Disney. But within reason, especially in the visual development phase, we really do branch out and do all kinds of different things that are risk taking. Um, so I call that style. There might be, you know, very specific influences. We kind of joked every single film I worked on at Disney, of course, and see why it is mentioned, of course. We kind of joked as background painters that we fantasized about working in oils on every single film. And then of course it was not efficient for the drawing time alone. Uh, but anyway, there's people that come up. Ivan Darol is talked about on literally every film, Mary Blair, all the usual suspects. So style hopefully is driven by content, right? The thematic content demands a certain style. I mean, one example is um, Sleeping Beauty. There's a reason Ivan Earl's style worked so well in its graphicness and in its posterizedness. It, it was harkening back to, you know, those medieval tapestries that really did the stacked perspective rather than linear perspective that we know today. I'm hearing a lot of beeping. So you get the idea, style can seem superficial. Hopefully it's driven by the content or the thematic content, but voice is something much more than that. And I would say your voice will shine through the given style of a project or not. Many <clears throat> artists have a very distinct voice which becomes their brand and sort of a commodity. If it's very personal and very distinct, and I call it flair, if it has a real strong personal flair, of course you're limiting the projects to which you're gonna be invited. So um, the versatile adaptable artist that demonstrates many styles in their portfolio is sort of geared toward one type of job. There, there's all kinds of careers out there and there's all kinds of needs out there on the parts of the studio. But I would say know who you are. Are you that versatile adaptable guy or girl that can jump on any film and help visually develop it? Or are you that artist with a unique brand that's gonna be invited, although to a very narrow range of projects because that's what's needed or wanted by the directors and the art directors. There is room for all of it. So the examples I use of the latter are, um, you know, Peter DeSev had a very distinct style before he was ever brought on by Blue Sky for the, um, there's a lot going on. Uh, before he was ever brought on for the Ice Age films. Some of you may know Gerald Scarf. He was responsible basically for the look of Hercules. He was brought on specifically in order to get his entire background. You know, he was a political cartoonist long before he was an illustrator and long before he was invited into animation. So I put that under the category of know thyself. Know what kind of career you want and shoot for the stars. I'm sorry if I'm distracted, there's construction going on outside and then I'm hearing and seeing things that I probably shouldn't be in the Zoom room. Yes, Dominic, so, I'm, I'm going to just request for everyone to make sure that their mic is off. Oh, okay. So uh, Can you mute I, them? I, can you mute them? I can, but uh, there's 380 people, so it's <laughs> difficult to go through now. So just, I'm just gonna, and you can also do that too. If you hear something, just mention it occasionally. I've been hearing things throughout. Okay, so I haven't sh shared my screen yet. Did I share my screen? Nope. Okay, so here we go. All right, so that's the name. Are you seeing it? That's the name of the presentation. Looks good. Okay. <laughs> now we covered this pretty much what, in fact, makes for a good portfolio if art is subjective. Now this next section, I'm not quite sure why it's here, but Assess it for yourself. What do these have in common? I mean, you can chime in if you like, but what sort of sub genre would this be? And we'll cut to the chase and I'll give you my take. You know, these are representational, certainly. They're figural, they're figurative. 
but they're rather academic. There's nothing particularly interpretive about them or narrative about them or conceptual about them. They're representational and they fall, in my opinion, into the academic realm. Again, plain air painting, figure painting, still life. I would say the same of these. Now, some could be called illustrations, but rather academic. Now this really feels different, doesn't it? They seem to transport you or they're a little more interactive, if that makes sense. You're intrigued and you wanna participate in them and perhaps connect dots. So these are examples of conceptual editorial illustration that are rather interactive. Same here. And this is kind of what I was raised on. You don't see much of it anymore, but when I started Art Center, everything, literally the illustration department was divided into uh, advertising and editorial. Advertising was rendering water droplets on fruit. It was very literal, very straightforward, very representational. The editorial realm was where you got to use your worldviews and your opinions and your emotional imprint and everything that makes you an artist. So there was a, a genre called conceptual editorial illustration. And it's what I was raised on and it's what kind of was happening in the illustration world at the time. There was fashion illustration as well, but it was done away with literally the term I started in 1989 because photography had taken over. The next, so this is still conceptual, Ever, so the idea was, if you're going to accompany an article in Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, Playboy, any of the major magazines, you want to intrigue people and get them to read the article. So again, I called it interactive, but every one of these doesn't tell a narrative story. That was a double negative. None of these tell a narrative story, but they do hopefully encapsulate the concept of the article in some way and invite you to participate in it and therefore intrigue you to read the article. Okay, now this you could argue is strictly narrative. It's not just representational. It's not necessarily conceptual where, you know, the, the sum is greater than the whole of its parts. Did I say that? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. <coughs> narrative. And you could argue that 500 years of art history were you know, basically visual storytelling revolved around narrative. A lot of biblical imagery became art. And you could argue, you know, in cinema, it's narratively based. However, I'm offering this idea that they're not mutually exclusive. And I'm sure a lot of you have a relationship with a conceptual approach. But to me, the work that really jumps out and speaks to people, and that actually might account for some of the consensus when the whole panel responds to something, Perhaps it's because it's not literal in its narrative. You're not just literally representing what's in the manuscript, you're bringing another level to it. So an example that I use is my very first um, illustration job. I was already working at Disney, <clears throat> but I wanted to do more children's books. So I was, you know, I knew if I ever leave Disney, I wanna have this career as a children's book illustrator. So I was already, you know, at Art Center, I burned the candle at both ends and Heart, you know, pulled all nighters. And then at Disney, I trained for six months on Lion King. So I continued that momentum of just nose to the grindstone. And then I got the wild hair. Like I said, if I ever leave Disney, I want to do children's books. So I started literally working for the big five, you know, Putnam, Random House, Simon and Schuster, uh, the majors, and uh, did a lot of covers, a lot of, uh, and I'm not proud of this, but choose your own adventure novels, a lot of interiors. And the first picture book I did where there was an illustration for every one of these stories, uh, one of the stories was <clears throat> Shakespeare's The Witch's Brew. And it's a really great poem. And anyway, the fun in it for me, for no good reason at all, I made all the witches around the cauldron identical. <clears throat> I don't know, it was just a fun, creepy level that I brought to it. The art editor said, well, it doesn't say that in the text. <laughs> and at 22 or whatever, I said, well, it doesn't not say that. It doesn't, you know, I just didn't understand the limited thinking, you know, and, and I don't think this art editor necessarily understood the levels we illustrators can bring to a project. 
So I, I ended the conversation saying, I think even William Shakespeare would want them to be identical. <laughs> and then literally there's another illustration where I put three ice cubes in the cup instead of five and they caught that. Make of that what you will. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my notes here. <clears throat> If you are taking notes, I, you know, the question is what makes a good portfolio? There may or may not be consensus, but when there is, perhaps it's because of that, like I mentioned, conceptual level. It's not strictly literal in the narrative interpretation. It brings other levels that invite participation. <clears throat> the next concept I want to run by you is, you know, finding your voice. I already sort of defined my opinion anyway about the difference between voice and style and continue thinking about that. But I mentioned style might be relevant and driven by the themes and demanded by the themes, but what is voice? That thing that shines through style. I'm gently offering that it's all the invisible stuff. Your, yes, socioeconomic background, your historical ethnic um, heritage, but more than that, it's your worldviews, your beliefs, your emotional imprint that's unique to you. Nobody else has the same emotional imprint that you have. So I call it <clears throat> sort of your fingerprint or your soul on paper if you're an illustrator. Um, that indefinable thing that actually transcends and speaks to people. So the word uh, authenticity gets thrown around a lot, but it's no small thing. And you know, the way to find one's voice, by the way, it's an ongoing thing. I don't know that you ever really arrive, right? I would hope in this artistic, this lifelong artistic journey, we continue to evolve. Those artists, and whether it's a singer songwriter or a gallery painter, you surely have examples that you can uh, think of where they sort of hit a stride and their craft becomes a commodity. And in the case of a singer songwriter, I'm thinking of, I mean, I'm gonna show my age, but you know, Elton John and Billy Joel and people like that that are singer songwriters. Once they make bank for the record company, they expect that same formula. And so I call it sort of plateauing or stagnating. They deliver the same formula that's making bank at the, you know, record store. And it's the same with artists. You know, if the gallery realizes, ah, the ones that are selling are the ones with the, <clears throat> the teary-eyed baby or, you know, the apple cart in the middle of the field, you got to have that sort of go-to. And uh, anyway, I would hope it's lifelong and that as you grow, uh, you know, as, as you emotionally mature and evolve spiritually, that that's reflected in your work. I actually don't think there's any way around that. <clears throat> so as an instructor for 20 years, I found it fascinating that you could kind of tell who had had a broken heart when you look at the crit rail. Like, okay, this person has nothing to lose. They're taking risks. This person is still safe, if that makes any sense. And then like midterm, you can go, okay, that person got a broken heart because their work exploded. Uh, I'm fascinated by that. And also the idea that there's almost no way for your cellular memory is the way I would put it, or even sort of, sort of the culturally relative stuff to come out, no matter how hard one tries to adapt the conventions and traditions of the given culture, their heritage always shows up on that crit rail. And that's not a bad thing. <clears throat> so, that I would say taking the time to do that, to analyze why do I love storytelling? What makes me a visual storyteller? And it happens at different times for different people. But I call that connecting craft with your authentic voice, finding your authentic voice. I know illustrators that <clears throat> literally go through their Egon Schiele phase, then their Klimt phase, then their Leindecker phase, maybe even their Norman Rockwell phase. And eventually, they sort of cherry pick, or subconsciously in an unexamined way, cherry pick those conventions and traditions that, that work for them. So you could call that mimicry, right? And I'm not gonna poo poo mimicry, it's how you learn and grow and find your own voice. But my point is at some point you will say, hey, I've hit a stride. It's not that you've arrived, but you may at some point have a body of work or you may already be there where you have a body of work that reflects a specific worldview and an authentic worldview. Um, I, I just am gonna tell a story real quick in that portfolio class that I taught for six years, 
day one, we would have everybody just <clears throat> put out their work, like literally, <clears throat> sorry, back in the day, it was physical work, you know, it wasn't digital when I started. So they would just dump all their work on the table uh, from, you know, their grad students. So they're ready to graduate, but everything they've done at Art Center up to that point. Sometimes the entire class would know that a piece was outdated or obsolete and didn't belong in the portfolio. But the artist couldn't see the forest for the trees, right? Or was not objective enough to see that something was sort of obsolete. And that's often because a piece is, uh, you know, represents growth. I really broke ground here and entered new territory, but it doesn't mean that it belongs in the portfolio. And so that's why it's so important to get feedback literally and kind of see how things are landing. Not that you need to please all the people all the time, but in order to have objectivity about your own work. I say peers are great, events like CTNX are great. So you can continue to sort of get that um, feedback on your work. Okay, so showcasing your voice. The portfolio can 100% showcase your work. So you might notice this conversation is about the content itself, but it's also about how you're showcasing it. So let's look at some examples of how you can showcase your voice. I, I kind of got into that know yourself, you know, know whether you're that versatile adaptable artist, know whether you have a very strong voice which became sort of a commodity or a brand, which might make for a very different kind of career uh, than you know that production artist who can just jump from film to film and adapt to the given style of that film. Okay, so now another way to assess what really makes for a good portfolio, if there's no right or wrong in art, is to just examine some of the conventional wisdoms. Uh, I would love at this point, if you do want to chime in and tell, tell me things you've heard, like do this, don't do that, because sometimes there's a grain of truth in them, but sometimes they're just off base or they just don't ring true. So I like to examine the conventional wisdoms. Have you heard this one, anyone? You're as strong as your weakest link. Um, that one I'm going to confirm instead of deny. Sorry. Um, I think it makes sense, <clears throat> right? But the, I guess what I was hinting at a minute ago is you may not even recognize the weakest link. That's why the feedback is so important. And, you know, well, let's keep going. Um, so the best way to showcase your authentic voice would be to start with the personal logo. You don't have to, but a lot of my students at Art Center wanted to, and it became a great way to brand the work. So I do want to say at this point, there's a difference between a you know an approach to a flat book portfolio and sort of an online portfolio. Of course, there's a difference. Uh, toward the end of my six years teaching the portfolio class, we kind of tried to hit all of that. The flat book portfolio, which is used less and less, but it's great for an event like CTN. You know, you can flip through an iPad, of course. But certain companies up until very recently still wanted, especially in TV animation, still wanted a physical flat book portfolio. But we kind of hit it all. We came up with a great graphic design that suited the work. We came up with an identity which was evident in the personal logo. And we sort of packaged it for the flat book, I'm calling it, the printed out portfolio. Then we did leave behinds, business cards, all kinds of promotional fare within that aesthetic that of course can translate to a website or an online portfolio. But I think, well, let's focus on the flat book and think of it that way for the moment. So I'm gonna show you some examples of personal logos. Once you sort of, and we did this in the class, you know, we said, all right, well, what are you all about? You know, why do you tell stories? And sometimes it, it took a while, you know, for a student to connect with why they do what they do. But adjectives help if you can just write down single adjectives of your essence, you know, the essence of that thumbprint I mentioned, uh, your soul on paper, what you uniquely have to offer, your authentic worldview. Uh, then that'll help you perhaps create a logo. And I'm going to show you examples. And they're not necessarily good or bad examples. They're just things I happen to have collected over the years. Um, sometimes it's 
a, an adorable little self-portrait. I love that one. That's uh, Cecile, or I worked with her in uh, Israel. Strangely, <laughs> she was uh, French, but I worked with her in Israel. And that, I don't remember whose that is, but I love that. Love that. We all know Elsa Chang. Um, she's a student, former student of mine, and of course, ended up doing very well, and a lot of uh, people are influenced by her. I loved this one because Andrew Bear, and it really took the whole group, and we sort of arrived at this. But I think this is conceptual, frankly, and it is does invite you in. So a great logo can also be interactive, if that makes sense. That feels more corporate to me, but it again, it's just got to feel like the work, and it's got to represent the work. That's very personal. I love that. And of course, you know, it, it can, you can do all your breakdowns, they call it, you know, a great logo, you kind of might reverse the figure ground relationship or do dark over light, light over dark, you might shrink it down and see if it holds up on a coffee mug or, you know, fuzzy dice or what kind, whatever kind of merchandising product you're going to do. And uh, sometimes you got to beef up lines to make it sure it holds up when you shrink it down. So we call those doing different breakdowns of the same logo. And that's mine, Dominic Domingo. Not Domino, but Domingo. <laughs> uh, and I, I, again, it's kind of boring as is, but I do different things with it. I render it out, I put highlights on it, depending on the context. Uh, I love that. You may know Noir Noir. She's um, worked at Nickelodeon for a million years on Cat Scratch and My Life as a Teenage Robot. Is that Nickelodeon? Anyway, but she also does gallery work and she's getting quite well known in that arena as well. Again, to me, that's very slick and professional, might border on corporate, but I, I think it suited the work. <clears throat> Love that. Okay, you get the idea? That's the personal logo. You may want to design one for yourself. And believe it or not, back in the day, and this is a great example of it, back in the day, artists or illustrators did this because often the portfolio was what we call tear sheets. Now, in my own lifetime, I've seen C prints were the norm, transparencies were the norm. You know, I've seen, you know, even iris prints when I was working at Disney, the obviously trends change. But at one time, if you had a bunch of tear sheets, if you were an editorial illustrator who illustrated those, like I said, magazines like Time Magazine or Sports Illustrated or Playboy, it was very sort of validating to not just use photographs of the original art, but the actual tear sheets from the publication. And if they slip out of your portfolio and there's no contact information on them, you know, you're kind of robbing yourself of potential work. So every page had a bar like this. Does that make sense? So you may want every page of your flat book portfolio anyway, or even perhaps on your online portfolio, your website can have an identifying logo and then your contact information, your preferred method of contact. All right, let's say bye-bye to that. <clears throat> now the next thing, if I go back to the uh, PowerPoint, The theme, you know, your portfolio <clears throat> should have motifs that create a graphic design theme. So again, that's basically the feel of the work as dictated by your authentic voice and what you have to offer. You're gonna see examples at the very end, I'm gonna flip through quickly some student portfolios that incorporate all of these ways of thinking. Oh, I want to go to, okay, so there's many ways to organize a portfolio. Now, if some of you, and I'm guessing some of you are what I call visual development generalists, you may lead with character design or you may lead with uh, color scripts or call outs. You might have something you lead with, but assuming you consider yourself a generalist, <clears throat> you may wanna show layouts, backgrounds, character designs, not storyboards so much, that tends to be a separate portfolio, but I, we put props, vehicles, and weapons in one category. Then other assets like, you know, backgrounds slash billboards slash map paintings. So assuming you have many kind of categories in your portfolio, think of it this way. You could go 
intellectual property by intellectual property for organizational purposes. Once you weed out those obsolete older pieces, you've got a bunch of content. How am I going to organize it? Within the context of the class, we very much made a decision. If you had the luxury, and I recommend this, by the way, if you're not in a school scenario where you have this kind of structure and discipline, assign yourself a great story, a great children's classic. Develop it from start to finish, the character designs and the props, vehicles, weapons. Do some color scripts, do color keys from those color scripts. Do some story beats, they're called. And that's where obviously, you know all this, where you illuminate a moment from the story. Usually from, you know, a nice storyboard panel, you just bring it to life. And often that one piece of key art or that moment painting can be the one thing that is the shining beacon that represents the project. Every film I worked on at Disney fell apart at some point. I mean, really, it was back to the drawing board on many, many films. And sometimes it was just this one piece of key art on the third floor in visual development that kept everybody excited and kept them going. You may have heard Pocahontas was pitched at a gong show by Mike Gabriel, but his pitch was really just a stunning piece of artwork and the title, and maybe a one word, pit, uh, one sentence pitch. So that's the power of great key art. Let's assume your portfolio is going to incorporate all of that. And <clears throat> you've assigned yourself a title and brought it to life. In school, you have the luxury of actually designing many titles during the, your time in a program. So you might have your Peter Pan stuff, your Monkey King stuff. Um, I, I assigned Phantom Tollbooth quite a bit, so I'll mention that. Princess and the Frog, who knows? But you've got a bunch of intellectual properties that you've brought to life. Imagine you can organize your portfolio according to title. So you start with Peter Pan. Now go in order. Here's my props, vehicles, weapons. Here's my character designs. Here are my color scripts. Here are my layouts and backgrounds. Then you go to the next title. You scroll through and exhibit the same thing. So I do think it's helpful. So you're not just jumping around from here to there. And it, it, you want uh, it to be an experience for the viewer flipping through your book. You want to take them on a journey. So if it's too nonlinear, they may just feel kind of beaten up when they're finished. So that's one way of organizing a portfolio. The other way, by contrast, would be organize it by asset. So here's my props, vehicles, weapons section. Then you scroll through the different titles or intellectual properties that you've developed. Then you move to backgrounds, billboards, matte paintings. Scroll through the intellectual property titles in the same order. So that's two great ways of organizing a portfolio if you're taking notes. Okay, so <clears throat> with either approach, you could sort of emblazon a title treatment on everyone so they know what they're looking at. And actually that gives confidence that, okay, they can adhere to a style, this artist, and they can honor that style start to finish within a title. So here's some examples of what I call title treatments. It's a little different than your personal logo. This is for the intellectual property itself. <clears throat> That's actually something I worked on personally for, um, you're not gonna know this guy anyway. <laughs> he directed Marathon Man a million years ago. Again, I, I've um, assigned this a lot and it's so you know fun for me as an instructor to see just all the different interpretations of one title and the worlds, the entire worlds that live inside of all of us. So for this um, <clears throat> title treatment, of course, I call it lateral exploration. Why would you not do 12 solutions and then settle on the right one? The Andrew Bear logo that I showed you a moment ago with feedback from the class, it actually ended up being a combination of little uh, qualities from each of his solutions in this lateral phase sort of clicked and was genius in my opinion. I love this. You kind of saw, ooh, okay. You kind of saw this black over white, I'm sorry, light over dark approach in portfolios a lot for a while there. I like it, but obviously you can lose, cause you know, that's kind of cinematic. You're sitting in a dark theater, you know, it kind of makes sense to trap the lights it's called, trapping the lights to create a focal point. 
But obviously you can flatten, right? Form goes kind of out the window in this scenario because nine times out of 10 on earth anyway, uh, atmospheric perspective means less contrast as things recede and they sort of usually recede into a lighter scenario and not a vacuum of black. So you lose form when you do this, but man, it's, it really is luminous. Oh, and <clears throat> you're gonna see the word prince a lot. That's because we were doing the little prince or le, le petit prince. And we, you know, just as an exercise started looking at different title treatments and what they communicate using that same word. So another great exercise is just throw out a couple adjectives. What is, what is this promise? What does it promise? It promises something elegant, um, refined, maybe poetic or I don't know, you get the idea. <laughs> um, you know, and then there's a more epic approach, biblical even. But I think it's really great to take your logo and actually run it by people and say, what is, you know, even if you don't know what the product is, is it a cinema? Is it a novel? What what does it promise? I mean, you get the idea. I wish we had more time. This is a good one to talk about, actually. I've asked people, if you don't know the story of Phantom Tollbooth, what does it seem to be about? And I hear, you know, urban, obviously, chaotic choices. And then eventually, if I have a gun and I put it to uh, the person's head that I'm questioning, we sort of arrive at, it seems to be about life choices in some way. And so you've seen a couple Prince of Egypt logos in different contexts. Those are sort of the breakdowns I was mentioning. And sometimes it's literally catering to a different uh, audience or readership. I loved this one. This was another one that evolved conceptually. Now it might be a little corny for you or it might seem to beat you over the head a little bit, but I think it's just subliminal enough, just my opinion. Uh, the Little Prince, the main theme is love. And I don't know if any of you love The Little Prince as much as I do, but it's a really, it's a classic for a reason, in my opinion. It really speaks to the human condition and specifically our bonds, you know, love is a bond. Uh, in, in Spanish, uh, yo quiero, uh, I think want, is love, it's interchangeable in some contexts. So in a way, love is the wanting of more. Uh, so the little prince, because it talks about taming or in French, apprivoisé, it talks about different types of love and what is mature love and what's puppy love and what's infatuation. And, um, so anyway, you surely see the heart. Uh, and then, uh, you know, everybody else sort of agrees. Yeah, well, it's elegant. It's a little bit funky, but mainly elegant, you know, uh, and the consensus is really great to run your um, title treatments by a group and see what the consensus is. So that's a great example of different contexts, different breakdowns, light over dark, dark over light. And I know in my portfolio, I do go back and forth in terms of the spread. Is the spread basically a white spread or a black spread for it's a it's a long conversation but sometimes if you're just putting a, a bunch of thumbnails together that led to your layout so you're putting ideation on the left and finished product on the right which is i recommend in a lot of cases so let's say even for a character design you're putting all the loose sketches on the left what i'm calling ideation or lateral exploration and you're putting oh i guess my i'm down in the corner now how about that uh, you're putting all the ideation on the left, then the finish on the right. A full color image, whether it's a background or sort of a rendering or a paint over on a character, sometimes benefits from a darker context. Like I said, if you fully modeled it and you're trapping the lights to bring out the form, darker can be better. The sketches seem to hold up better on a lighter ground, if that makes sense, because you need a figure ground relationship. Do you see how if when you squint your eyes, this still pops off the page because it's dark over light. So that's called a figure ground relationship. So I toggle in my own portfolio back and forth between light spread, dark spread, light spread, dark spread, depending on the content. 
So for that reason alone, it's really great to have both, right? Have both options. So you're still identifying the work by the title of the intellectual property. I love that one for a million reasons. You kind of know what you're gonna get and think of your own adjectives. What does it promise? Love that. <clears throat> you get the idea. That's the last one of those. I'm feeling a little rushed now. What time is it? Yeah, we got about 15 minutes left. And then again, I'm going to repeat this. We can continue because <clears throat> I know for a fact I'm not going to get to the portfolios that I picked. I randomly picked a couple portfolios from those that were uploaded. And they will be great to talk about if you guys want to stay around. And um, sometimes, to be honest, we learn more from listening in on feedback. Uh, all of us can be very precious about our own work, you know, and even defensive, it's tough not to be. So sometimes you don't hear the feedback because you're kind of thinking of your defense, right? Uh, whereas with a safe group, you know, if everybody realizes we're all here to you know, help one another and we're on the same side, it can be really helpful to just actually hear uh, what's being said about somebody else's work because you actually hear it. So I hope people hang in for that. I do, before I forget, I want to share, maybe I'm going to unshare my screen for one second. I mean, yeah, unshare my desktop. So for the record, we're not getting, we're not going to get to everything today, but I wanted to say there is a great article that I wrote <laughs> that you can also refer to that covers this and so much more. And um, it's for Animation Magazine. <clears throat> And I actually interviewed recruiters and visual development artists and art directors. And <clears throat> they certainly confirmed a lot of what I'm saying, but some things that never would have occurred to me. So it's, uh, I recommend, now the sun's coming in. I recommend checking this out. And it's <clears throat> volume. I don't know if you can find it online. It is online somewhere, but it's volume 32, issue three number 278, whatever that means. Volume 32, issue three, number 278. And so like Tiffany Harrington, if you know that name, she's a recruiter, Jana Day from Sony, Christoph Vasher, who's an amazing, he was a fellow background painter with me at Disney and he's gone on and art directed many things. And then uh, Olivier Tosson, who's one of my favorite visual development artists, they all kind of chime in and uh, usually confirm what I've already said, but sometimes there's a little twist. So check that out if you can get your hands on it. And <clears throat> to make sure I fit everything in. Oh, to go back, going back to examining some of the conventional wisdoms. <clears throat> oh, I need to share my screen. Okay, so have you heard this one? Well, no, this isn't so much a myth, but it's something I've noticed. You know, that a portfolio should kind of manage everything. You know, maybe you, you are multifaceted and you have sort of, you're a, you model. I model just enough in Maya to be able to help in my visual development process. I actually use SketchUp quite a bit, but I don't think for a minute I'm a modeler. I, I can do it enough to help me out in my process. What inevitably happens, and I've seen it a lot in teaching that portfolio class, is somebody took one Maya class and learned to do a really low poly model that might fly in certain <clears throat> subgenres of gaming, but it doesn't necessarily belong in the portfolio. So one rule of thumb I, I impart is, you know, if there's enough to justify a section, include it. If you're, if you show one, graphic design <clears throat> was a poster and some personal work and some gallery work or fine art, if it's not relevant to the position you're applying for, it may not warrant a section. So I do feel like people put everything in there, including the kitchen sink, because they want to show every possible aspect of who they are. I say, you know, do your research on the opportunity. So if there's a job posting, it's going to be very specific. It's a sort of, 
position in the production pipeline that has its own wants and needs. So I say research those, get to know the different departments in the production pipeline of the genre you're applying for. They're gonna be different, a little bit different in TV than they are in feature. Surely you've heard, you know, deadlines are tighter in TV. So again, uh, know thyself. That was one of the first slides. But then do your research. Do your research on the position, the needs of that niche. And don't put everything, including the kitchen sink, in there. Put the content that's most relevant to the position and the opportunity. So the way I put it is I actually change up my portfolio all the time, depending on the opportunity. So just my opinion, there really is no catch-all entertainment portfolio. I did hint if you're focusing on a visual development generalist, sure, you could have color callouts, texture callouts, fully rendered um, paint overs. You could have raw designs, character designs. You could have map paintings and billboards and backgrounds. You can have it all. But usually you lead with something. And I hate to say it, but props can often be an entry level position. So I know in TV, a lot of people kind of lead with props. All right, so there is no, just my opinion, no catch-all portfolio. We kind of talked about this, you know, once you dump your portfolio on the table, get some feedback. And in the context of the class, it was the opinions of the group, you know, what's relevant, what seems consistent with this fully mature voice that you've arrived at and plucking out the things that are obsolete or irrelevant. Once you've edited your content, sometimes there is something missing. And I, I guarantee you it's the case with a lot of you because I looked through the ones that were uploaded. Now, I know that you could only upload 12 images to your profile on CTN. Uh, I then went to some websites and looked, hey, what can I pluck off the interwebs that will supplement the 12 that they were limited to? So I, I do know that. But I'm guessing still a lot of us, if... If we decide I'm going to lead with color scripting, because I'm a great colorist, I understand the psychological level of color, physiological effects of color, the culturally relative associations with color. I'm a colorist. You know, I've done 10 years of plain air painting. So, you know, nobody can nail a warm, cool relationship like me. If you identify as a colorist and you want to lead with that, then you're going to have the majority of the work will adhere to that section. But if you notice, oh, I want to include moment paintings, but I don't quite have enough of them. That's where you assign yourself a title, like I said, and give yourself the opportunity to do that. I recommend being in a program if you're not, you know, it's just a great, we all need deadlines and we all need structure within which to create. And you get the added benefit of feedback from peers. So I, I would find those opportunities. Uh, I've done a lot of independent studies with people that were not even my art center students from other, you know, uh, I, I anyway, I pitched a class for public programs at art center, art center at night. It didn't run, but some of the people that had wanted to enroll and then it didn't run ended up being my independent studies. So they had this sort of innate understanding that, you know, opportunities uh, to create content are really helpful and having deadlines and structure are really helpful. So I do recommend filling those gaps in the portfolio if you don't have enough work to justify a particular section as a generalist. <clears throat> All right, have you heard this one? Start with a bang, end with a bang. This one gets problematic when you think, well, then what's in the middle? <laughs> like mediocre work. Um, so this doesn't reconcile well with you're as strong as your weakest link, does it? If you start with a bang and end with a bang, that means there's a weak link in there somewhere. So the way I sort of reconcile it and what I'm offering to you is what's meant by start with a bang, end with a bang is simply people like shiny objects. So if you've got a bunch of sketches in the middle, it's as simple as do something really stunning, a full color image that transcends the gutter maybe and is a double page spread. So that I'm kind of jokingly calling that a shiny object. People respond to that. So the, the work should all be equally strong in my opinion, but starting with a bang might mean a full color image that's a double page spread. 
Oh, well, so in the portfolio class, and what I didn't say is Bill Wallen co-taught it with me. And if you don't know Bill, he's a graphic designer. He's had a graphic design firm for years. I was a little bit more in touch with the creative process in general. It's very nurturing of that and the artistic journey at large, the lifelong journey that I mentioned. And so I was kind of an advocate for the artistry and the creative expression. Bill was a businessman and he's really great at branding, which he's now applying to digital marketing and digital branding. But suffice it to say, he was the first, his firm was the first one to retain the intellectual property rights for their work, specifically their logos. So we all know the Batman logo. That's the first one he fought with Warner Brothers to retain the intellectual property rights. He did the Jaws poster, the original, if you know that. Gary Meyer illustrated it, but Bill Wallen's firm, Wallen Design, did the poster. So the dude knows what he's talking about. So what we would do in that class is if somebody said, man, I, I want to be a character designer and their work is okay, just, just okay. I hate, it sounds really judgmental, but I, you know, if that's the consensus, you might want to do some bells and whistles. And so Bill was great at identifying, oh my God, that because he identifies as a thinker. He'll say himself, I'm not the best drawer. I'm not the best painter. I never mastered that, but you know what? I'm a marketer and I'm a great graphic designer. So he would take students that might not have the strongest sort of academic proficiency as we called it earlier in a given area, but he would do the bells and whistles that really demonstrated what they do have to offer. Creative thinking, marketing, packaging. So I kind of joke like some of the portfolios played music and shot out fireworks when you opened them. Uh, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but kind of not. I mean, one of them was shaped like a coffin and it was a box. It was really precious and beautiful. Sometimes small and intimate is better because it invites them in. It's on a case by case basis. There is no one way to package yourself or market yourself. So I say bells and whistles or bare bones is on a case by case basis. The next one I think is less is more. No, somewhere in there, you've heard that one too, right? Less is more. I would say, again, it's on a case by case basis. We had artists in that class that had so many quick studies that just show basic, you know, breaking down to the picture plane, cinematic composition, film language, and even they could be black and white, they could be color, didn't matter. But the sheer volume, page after page of studies really demonstrated something. It showed, you know what, this dude can crank out comps like that in his sleep, his or her sleep. So the sheer volume of them gives confidence that this person is prolific and can draw on this quite easily. Uh, in another case, if you do have weak links and you know it, then less is certainly more. So I would confirm that one, that conventional wisdom. We already talked about this a little bit. If you've got a great flat book portfolio, you may want to, of course, conform it to the digital realm and social media, but you also might want to create some leave behinds for events like CTN, if nothing else. You know, Bill Wallen would say, I'm approached by illustrators every day at my graphic design firm, and I really do uh, keep that calendar on the wall. And I, you know, they, he loves and cherishes some of the leave behinds he's been given. And clearly he's more apt to remember a given illustrator if he's got that calendar or those fuzzy dice, I jokingly say, in his car. All right, that's kind of what I've got so far. And, oh, we're out of time. The hour has passed. So for anyone that's still hanging in there, I'm going to flip through some of my Art Center portfolios really quickly, and you'll hopefully see demonstrated everything we just talked about. Um, where is it? Oh, I know. All right, so let's start with uh, Melanie. She's, this is a student I had a few years ago. I happen to love her work. It may not be the best, by the way, the best illustration. Some of them, I just picked them at random. Uh, but I think, if I remember correctly, 
the ideation was on the left, as you see here. I'm going to shrink the window because the gallery view is blocking <clears throat> what I'm trying to look at. Okay, so ideation would be on the left like this, and then finish on the right. Ideation on the left, finish on the right. So in this case, you see layout, value study, color key. Believe it or not, as a background painter, all of those steps come into play and feature anyway, not always uh, on TV. Ideation on the left, finish on the right. I guess she composited all of the above. And this one, this is a randomness exercise where she took, as, as you see, the splatter on the left and was asked to create something out of it. Here you see the ideation composited with the final rendered design on the same page. Same here. I find this very charming. And believe it or not, here's something worth talking about. You know, the way you composite sketches on a page can flow. And even over a double page spread, this is not a great example of it, but think of the double page spread as a composition. Do you have an S curve or a C curve journey that guides you over the gutter to the next page? You can composite your sketches in a way that directs the eye. Hope that makes sense. You know, and then you're always choosing whether to sort of vignette a sketch. You can enlarge sketches and they can be screened back, it's called, in the background. And, and they can be an element that actually directs the eye across the double page spread. I'm not, here's a thought, just my opinion, but I find even though the blue is very animation, it automatically puts it in a context. I am distracted by it. So I would recommend, you know, if you're gonna show that color erase blue, uh, that non-repro blue, maybe just make it all blue <laughs> or unity it's called. It's a huge concept in design because what happens is you are unintentionally creating focal points where you may not intend to. Your eye will go to the saturation no matter what. There's the uh, title treatment for one of her many intellectual properties that she developed. See, she is kind of ending with a bang because she put the big story beats at the very end. Let's go to one more. Um, hmm. Different Melanie or same Melanie? Don't know. Hmm. See how the, the color is distracting. So I like unity until you really want to draw the attention to a focal point. And I guess I'm saying, you know, the focal point on this spread would be the fully painted characters. This is sort of an example of how the sketches are well placed and well thought out in terms of how they conduct the eye. Oh, I do love her work. I'm remembering now, I really love this, the work for the little prints that she did. Look at the flow. I wish, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but you know, either intuitively, I don't, I'm not gonna say thought went into this, but consideration went into it. Mm, love this spread. So hopefully you're seeing again, the contact information. So the graphic design sensibility here is pretty minimal. Sometimes we'll have a bar across the top with the name of the artist. Maybe it's a bar, a graphic bar down at the bottom with the contact info and then the title treatment. So you quickly identify which title the assets belong to. Oh, silhouettes. <clears throat> see the little silhouettes that became the sketches, that became the characters? Those seem to be really understood in gaming. The higher ups even understand them because the minute you get to a given level, you know, a sound cue might sort of alert you that the, the, the badass, the boss is in the area, like the dragging of an axe, something like that. But the silhouettes 
just need to convey something immediately. So adjectives, again, are good. If your silhouette immediately conveys intimidating, um, menacing, whatever it is your villain is meant to convey, you're ahead of the game. And the interior you know, details are kind of secondary at that point. All right, I want to um, end, I love that. Want to end this part of it and say, let's break into, if anyone wants to keep going, I can gladly go through the portfolios that were submitted. I picked four of them. And then we can unmute those people and um, keep going if they want to. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm going to unshare my screen here. Well, Thank Dominic, you. we haven't had any actual questions come in. Really? Uh, did a lot of great comments, though. But uh, comments, here's okay. a question. Should character designs include a description? Wow, I'm so glad you asked that because I did have a section in my notes where I always address that, again, in my opinion, case by case basis. So Bill Wallen, the guy that I mentioned, he was into, man, if this isn't necessarily the best draftsman or the best painter, I do want to know how they think. I want to be sold on their conceptual process. So he was actually the one guy who will read in a portfolio. Many people won't. So I think of it as real estate. You know, if you're leading with these stunning paintings, sure, you can show your ideation, you can show your reference, but I think you're wasting valuable real estate if the work speaks for itself and it's strong enough, if that makes sense. But for somebody who may not be as strong of a designer and they want to sell whoever it is on the other side of the table on their conceptual process, they're more apt to put that reference and um, put little explanations. So I do think it's on a case by case basis. Some people will take time to read it, some won't, and they're of the mindset that the work should speak for itself. Follow your heart. I wouldn't, I mean, in any scenario, I just wouldn't waste too much real estate on text, period. I have another question. Is it important to explain the, with, I'm sorry, what is your opinion of mood boards in portfolios? Mood boards. Hmm. I don't know if I'm sure what that is, but I mean, if it's what it sounds like, I've heard a couple different terms for it. I believe it's one character with different uh, facial expressions. Oh, 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 of course, of course. So if you're a character designer, you can have a full model sheet or not. I think, you know, and a full model sheet, in addition to just, you know, the sketch, then the full, whether it's a paint over or just a fully rendered painting of the character. A lot of people stop there. We all know that keeping a character on model while demonstrating a range of facial expressions really is, is going to be needed on production, right? What is going to require a blend shape? When does it go off model? So I've coached people through keeping a character on model while showing the range of facial expressions. It's a real skill set. And I won't go on and on, but you know, what happens is eyes do not drift closer together and far apart. They just don't. The angle could change, right? My eyes are like this. And then when I tilt my head, they're more like that. But you see them moving closer. That's the first thing that will send a character off model. So I do think it's a skill set. If you're good at it, I think it's very important. Those just, you know, so we call those facial expressions. Gestures, equally important for production. I would make a decision, you know, the way I put it is the work should be inspirational above all else. If you feel obligated to put a turnaround with a stiff character because that's what the modeler, modelers are gonna need, it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot because it's stiff by definition. So I find a balance between what I call production oriented stuff. God knows I have tileable textures that I've done. God knows I've done all kinds of call outs and texture call outs on production. Do I feel the need to include them always for every opportunity? No, I want to inspire. So another way of putting it, I kind of mentioned you can change up your portfolio for a given opportunity. You can also choose to show the more production oriented stuff that's boring as hell and maybe not as inspirational on an as needed basis. So personally, I, I always end a correspondence with, you know, if you wanna see my, um, more production oriented fare like color callouts, tileable textures, paint overs, 
Maya models, SketchUp models, everything that led to this, I'm glad to show it to you on an as needed basis, just ask. So I hope that helps, you know, um, you could have a portfolio of nothing but full model sheets, it's called. Painting, you know, ideation, sketches, finished design as a drawing, finished design as a painting, uh, turnaround, gestures, facial expressions. If you're that guy who's good at all of that, I say every one of your character designs in that portfolio should be a full model sheet. If you're going for character designer and not generalist, and if you're damn good at all of them. Okay, we don't have too much time left. Uh, can you take a look at your selected artist portfolios? Yes. Um, I'm gonna go in the order that um, Alicia mentioned. So David Liu would be first. Is he out there? David Liu. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I'm glad he unmuted. Hey there. Yeah, my name is a little bit different on the portfolio. Oh, sorry. Oh, I have the wrong guy. Hold on. So you are David, right? Uh, yeah, I am. David Liu. Uh, my name is also Guo Wei. It's, yeah. Is that you? <laughs> David, yeah, that's me. Sorry, can you, can you hear me? Is my mic all right? It's a little rough. <laughs> I hope I'm not, I'm, I'm not that choppy, but yeah, I can hear you. Um, and I'm, I apologize. I don't want to make it full screen. It's a long story, but I can't, my escape button, uh, I spilled coffee on my laptop, so I can't escape. So I'm terrified of going full screen. I love that. David, would you call this packaging or, you know, graphic design? What, what is this used for the cover not, of the uh, novel? It's not screen shared yet, I believe. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. I thought you were looking at it this whole time. Uh, give me one second. All right. Here we are. David. Is he there? You are seeing my screen? Yes. Uh, yeah, I am. Sorry, I'm typing in chat right now because I know I'm very choppy. Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, it, this is the cover of a novel, correct? Uh, well, this is more like a cover for like an animated TV show I would like to work on uh, in five years. Maybe even one. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> right on. Hey, I'm going to remove the... Um... I keep forgetting your name, Matt. Today's Matt. What's what's your name? Bruce. Bruce. There we go. Oh no, I I figured it out. I wanted to get rid of the gallery view at the bottom because it was blocking my view of the artwork. Okay, Bruce. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. It takes a lot of preparation to do these things. No anyway, I like that, David. Um, wow, beautiful color. So sometimes, as you know, from listening to this lecture, you know, sometimes there's a conversation about the content itself, and then an entirely separate conversation about how we're presenting it, or packaging your voice is the way I put it. So David, I do have a question. You were limited to 12 images on the profile, on CTN's profile, correct? There is more on your personal website, is that right? Uh, yeah, there's like actually way more. Uh, all the roughs are on the um, are on my personal website. Oh, and uh, someone said, uh, "Yeah, Bloodborne." That is actually based on Bloodborne. Nice, nice. Well, so you get so to me, this is what like a sampler platter. You know, this is a quick sampler platter of what I'm all about, and that's awesome. But it's a little hard to have a conversation about you know the the experience of flipping through a portfolio and whether it takes you on a journey or not. I would say this is all really strong work and it shares, you know, a really strong design sensibility that has an academic basis. I love it. And personally, your voice from, you know, what I can perceive shines through. I love how you've composited, yes, a title treatment with the layout, value study, color key and finish. You're ahead of the game. I love this, you know, these schematics or, you know, plan views, whatever you want to call them are really production oriented and really helpful. 
And then having texture callouts or color callouts is something that's very needed on production. So I love that. I know this is a sampler platter. My wish would be, you know, that you put some thought into organizing it and maybe all of your schematics and your callouts go in one section. Maybe all of your moment paintings like this go in another section with the ideation composited sort of the same way on every page. And then, and I'm, you probably already did that. Love it, love the, you know, we were talking a moment ago about how each individual composition in its own right needs to be well composed. But then when composited on a page, how you can think of the overall composition of the page, or for that matter, of the double page spread. The flow and the rhythm of these two is flawless. I love it. Man, and I love the whimsy of your character designs. It just doesn't get any better. So I have no advice. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think you're doing all the right things, man. And I, I love, uh, you know, your personal flair. It's exactly what I was talking about. You know, um, I know, I mean, I don't claim to know you, but I think I know what I'm going to get from you. And that is really strong story, visual storytelling. So sorry, I don't really have anything critical. I mean, oh, thanks. I got <laughs> if you if you want something critical, I wouldn't lead with this. Uh, because to me, it's it's graphic design, it's packaging your way more than that. So I wouldn't got it. I certainly wouldn't lead with this. Uh, you could include it, but it, I just it, it promises the wrong thing, just my opinion. Anyway, thank you, David. That was awesome. I'm going to go to the next participant. Have a good day. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, see you. Is this Yanjia? Yanjia? I'm looking for um, this yes. person. Oh, there they are. Yes, yes. You, you can hear me? Yes, how are oh you? Oh my God, thank you. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, I did have, you know, I of course went over these in advance, but yeah. because I did a presentation yesterday, which took a lot out of me and it took all my faculties. So believe yes. it or not, I kind of wanted to just off the cuff, you know what I mean? You're just getting a wow. quick impression. I didn't prepare a reaction to any of this, but uh, beautiful work, man. Thank you. I'm still building this portfolio. Like I, I have all of updates right now, but I cannot actually uh, update right now. But yeah, this is what I have when I upload it though. Right, I, I totally understand 12 pieces. <laughs> well, I call it a sampler platter, right? It's you, Thanks. in a portfolio or in an online portfolio that you can scroll through, it's gonna be a whole different experience. I get that. So all I can really do is talk about the work itself. I mean, I love everything about this. I love the technique and sort of the, the grid and the texture. It feels somewhat traditional. I love your mastery of warm, cool relationships and lighting. It really transports me, you know, it's very vivid. I love, we were talking about schematics earlier, love this idea. And you're doing a lot of the things we talked about. The title treatment is very much in keeping with I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sort of the Victorian design. Is this Art Nouveau? Yes, uh, Re Regency, like right before uh, right, Victorian. Right, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this typeface. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, it's flawless page. It intrigues. I mean, this is a great balance of very production oriented and it's going to serve a purpose on production. And it gives, I'm guessing, you know, an art director faith that you can manage the produ production oriented stuff. There are artists who can do the blue sky, I call it, the blue sky work, but may not be able to buckle down and do something production oriented. This has both, you know, it shows your imagination and uh, your flair. And Thank you. you. Yeah, it's beautiful. I, I do have a question about this page though. Yes. Like the, the, um, like the, the style doesn't really match. <laughs> like it was like it's like the, the, the one on the right is is much more polished or realistic than the cartoony line works included on like the spots set dressing on on the left so i was thinking about uh like change like unify them to, or is it necessary you're talking okay but it sounds the style 
Yes. So, so Regency. Yeah. The style of the content is consistent. The content is consistent, right? There's an inherent yes. style in the armoires. There's an inherent style in the decor. You're talking yes. about the, the rendering technique. Right? Yes, yes, the rendering, exactly. Right. Well, it couldn't hurt. I mean, I don't see a huge difference. If you hadn't told me that, I <laughs> okay, don't, thank you. don't say that on an interview, number one. Sure. But I could see that. Why not? Why not conform it? Yeah. Yes. yes I mean, I'll would you say the one on the left is a little more posterized, more graphic? Yeah. 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 That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Less yes. modeling. Less, sure. Yeah. Okay. Simplicity, I mean, goes a long way, right? <laughs> right. Almost anyone within reason can render something photorealistically. I personally think it's more sophisticated to break something down into a simple statement. So sure, take the one on the yes. right. I'm glad you said okay. that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> I love lineups for a million reasons. It's not Thank just you. a size comparison chart. It's mm -hmm. what does their essence immediately communicate? So I'm big in my classes, I actually have them do silhouettes, but also come up with adjectives. And I'm sure you did that. What should it immediately convey even as a silhouette? So without analyzing it, you know what I mean? The round, yeah. we all know this, the round shapes. Oh, I love the follow through on that. Are you an Al Hirschfeld fan? Do you know him? Uh, can you say that name again? Al, uh, like there's a broken of info here. Al Hirschfeld? Uh, Sorry, maybe no. <laughs> oh, check Did him you out. spell that? Yeah. Al. Oh, oh, Al Hirschfeld. Yes, I, right. I, I wrote, I read it. Yes, I, I, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Pretty much and all, all character designs. Yes, yes. All Design, characters. shapes, yeah. yes, yes. Well, the follow through, they call it the through line. Do you see through how line. that is your through line? It's oh. not the center line in a gesture, you know, it's not the center of yes. balance it's the through line love that the Thank flow you. is amazing yes yeah what is what's his essence tell me about him real quick just adjectives what's he um, about? noble mm -hmm. proud mm. proud, proud is that a negative thing is he prideful or just proud um like he later changed a little bit, mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a uh, it's a negative at first, right, but right, right, right. but then positive later right. on. That's called an arc, right? Arc, <laughs> yeah, in, ter in, in our arc. <laughs> like I, I, I wish to to achieve that though. So he he's well. Uh, the, only, the reason I ask, I mean, I think I know you're really good at communicating their essence. So thanks. I do know who these people are, but the reason I ask is there's an awkwardness about him. Is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he, he's a little in, in a introvert. Uh, right, right. Uh, so, like, but he has to take a lot of family responsibility since young and be like a peacock all the time. So he's right. a little bit awkward. Right. Yes. So, so here's what I'm getting. You know, I'm trying to make this valuable for everybody. So here you yes. have amazing flow and amazing rhythm, and it's called a through line. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a strong shape. A pyramid is the strongest shape you could employ in any composition. So I love that. Do you see how this is a strong shape with rhythm and flow? Yes. It's amazing. Here, immediately, I call it the X factor, right? There is no movement because of the X factor, it's called. Look at this line and look at that line. They form an X right at the fist. So that hangs you up and you don't flow around the drawing, right? You don't continue to flow. So yeah. beware of tangencies, they're called, because yes. they hang up the eye and create unintended focal points. So oh, okay. that's why I asked if he was meant to be awkward because he's not flowing. You know, this flows in a way that says confidence. This yes. flows in a way that says eager. Mm -hmm. uh, this doesn't flow. He's mm -hmm. awkward. Does that make sense? So if it's appropriate to his character, awesome. You know, yeah. this guy yeah. outgoing and genial and um, gregarious, and he's a number of things, and wouldn't be if he was stilted like this guy. So anyway, you know what you're doing, but it's worth talking about, you know, the flow yes. of this one versus the, the stilted sort of uh, static quality of this one. Yes. Okay. Um, wow, this is great. 
<laughs> I really respond to the less, this one. Yeah, and this one, the iconic. Mm. You know, they're very almost primitive. No offense. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, no! I love them actually better. Uh, like the, the style now changed a lot, so I'll definitely take your precious feedback into my. Well, here's, here's, no, it's all exploration. So I think it all belongs because you're. It's all exploration. If it's meant to be consistent, then it's a problem. But um, you know what I mean? Once you hit on the final design, and that I do encounter that with students a lot, they actually don't know if it's meant to be on model or if it's a variation or a facial expression of the finalized design or whether it's still exploration. I think in your portfolio, that should be clear. You know, here is my lateral exploration with different shape orientations for each solution with different influences, whether it be primitive or more conventional Disney-esque you know, you have yeah. what they call lateral solutions. It should be clear to the viewer if you're trying to demonstrate keeping something on model while exploring different gestures and facial expressions and when you're still exploring shape language and sort of motifs. Yes. Okay, so I'm just gonna say, just to me, but mm -hmm. I, I think you, your soul is evident in these less conventional designs than mm -hmm. the more commercial, you know, Disney, DreamWorks, PDI, Pixar realm. You're really yeah. good at this. Well, nothing wrong with it. You're really good at it. I mean, <laughs> you might think Glenn Keane drew that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just think about it. You know, maybe you put the more commercial stuff all in one title, right? And you put yeah. the more funky personal stuff in, under another title. Yes. Just a thought. Organize it so they know you're in control of all that. Gotcha. Thank yeah, you. and sometimes yeah. with artists, it's a matter of finding a way to take the funkiness and the authenticity and then put it in a context like Disney, DreamWorks, PDI, Pixar. You know, the, the, the early visual development is always way more exploratory than what ends up on the screen. And there's a million reasons for that. Uh, you have stockholders to please, there's a brand to conform to. But also think of this, within each department, no matter how stunning and cutting edge and avant-garde the blue sky work is, every department falls back on old conventions when you get into production, because time is money. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. You can't control that aspect of it. Anyway, right. you, know, you know what you're doing. Look at this one, you guys, if anyone's still out there. Love that. Yeah, so you know what I'm saying? Like, find a way to infuse the finalized designs, even if they're more commercial, with what you're capable of. It doesn't look at that. I mean, I love films that allow funky character designs. You know, there's always limitations. Like, you know, if you do skinny little legs, there's a million reasons that's a problem. It's going to strobe on screen when it becomes a single line of pixels. Um, and then you, we all know, you know, you can't have too many sharp edges because uh, it's going to fall apart in the model. There, there's, a lot, there's a lot of limitations. So I think it's a real art to be able to take some really strong design decisions. And, you know, if you do a painting, for example, paint them in a way where a modeler can go, yep, that's possible. I can do that. Does that make sense? Yes, a little bit? yes totally. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. You're great. You're doing it already, though. You're doing all of this. It, may, it might be a matter of organizing, though, so you don't kind of throw people for a loop. You, you, it will tell them, I know exactly when I'm being funky, and I know when I'm being more conventional and mainstream. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Is this older work or no? Yeah, yeah, this is really, really old. <laughs> so this is a case where, you know, I kind of mentioned in the class, sometimes the artist, you know, is attached to a piece for a sentimental reason or because it represented some kind of growth, but everyone else in the room will go, yeah, uh, they can tell you did it when you first started Art Center, for example. There's nothing wrong with this, but I don't see the level of mastery of your voice, not technique, not mm -hmm. academic. Something is yeah. going on where you, I can tell it's an older piece. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely update it. Um, I have a project and I'll, I'll 
all, like it was all of the notes taken from this session. Mm -hmm. I'll, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I hope that wasn't um, discouraging. No, 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 definitely. No, 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 I, I, I know it's, it's weak. <laughs> Well, it's just, I don't know, it just didn't fit. So I thought I would ask if it was old. You know, again, if you keep a balance of the old stuff, the new stuff, you know, the new sensibility, the slight, the last thing you were exploring, it could work, yeah. you know, just have a rhythm to your portfolio. Okay. Uh, I don't love his face. Right. For some reason. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Maybe um, just do some head studies right. separately, you know what I mean? And make sure the silhouette, like if you took that face at that angle and silhouetted mm -hmm. it independently, you'd see it doesn't hold up the way these things do. That does, yes. see this one right here? That's yeah. a strong shape. So I like this exercise of hair shapes are huge in animation, right? All mm -hmm. the Warner Brothers, I wish I could draw, but all the Warner Brothers, Characters are basically the same, like match stick, like a burnt match shape. And then you just yes. stick a bill on it and suddenly it's Daffy Duck. You stick a hair shape on it and it's somebody else. So I love this idea of, as you know, building one shape upon the next and not necessarily three dimensional shapes, but graphic shapes. So mm -hmm. everything here feels like, you know, that idea of simple to complex, simple yes. shape, and you built more complex shapes on top of them. Both of these yes. up beautifully, and this doesn't, if that makes sense. So, <laughs> right. Well, I'd analyze just the head shape, and yes. Wow, look at the flow of these. These are great. You're all about flow, silhouette, and flow. Mm -hmm. Not, it's not for me to tell you what you're all about. But <laughs> oh no, 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 <laughs> no! Yeah, totally, like this is really precious workshop for me. <laughs> these are great. Look at that. Wow. You're good at um, men and women, you know, it's hard. And I don't know if you're trying to idealize, but there is that idea of, um, uh, you know, um, I would love to do, actually do funky shapes. Um, I, I think I am more like, I, I'm more comfortable when uh, this is a client work and I'm assigned to do like a half realistic for like TV show uh, and comic. So right. Like I'm more comfortable in doing stuff like this, but I, I feel more relaxed in doing funky ones. And I, I think well, like yeah. maybe portfolio wise, should I actually do funky ones? Because you say like, I have, <laughs> I have my soul lying there. <laughs> well, I mean, here's a few thoughts. Yes. I think idealizing as an mm -hmm. approach, idealizing is tough and uh, not everyone can do it. And then not everyone can do really interpretive stuff. So mm -hmm. as long as you have the range, I think you should demonstrate both. Okay. You know, but be clear about it, you know, and maybe again, it's about organizing. One project yes. is funky. One project is a little more conventional. Uh, but yes. you, you are good at all of it. And that is not easy to do. You know, I personally am intrigued by characters that I mean, even in terms of performance, you know, characters that, of course, are faulted. But when I watch foreign films, art films, independent films, I love that it's not Tom Hanks up there or Meryl Streep, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're, uh, European films are more apt to put less idealized, is the nice way of putting it, less pretty people up there. Yeah, 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 totally. And you, you grow to love them more, you grow to love them more because of their faults. So personally, I love when a character is, you know, beautiful, but funk, you know, she's not perfect. She's not a Barbie doll. I yeah. love the dude, like, um, what was it? Uh, Frozen. Mm -hmm. Look at all the male characters in that. Genius. Because they're not GQ models, right? They're yes. all a little dumpy or a little frumpy. And yet you, they're very appealing right so that's yes. a huge word in animation appeal so if you can find that balance you're in good shape man and you are you're doing it uh, no um so far away I, I will try more thank you <laughs> yeah and maybe maybe um again you're gonna decide on the content for the opportunity so maybe sometimes you'll show just the idealized stuff sometimes you'll show mm -hmm. the more edgy uh less idealized stuff 
But I yes. think keep exercising both muscles is the way I would put it in your journey. Keep exercising both. Right. Anyway, thanks for sharing. <laughs> I love that guy. Is that Will um, Smith or no? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Will Smith. I love it. Dude. Wow, wow. Yeah, you're good at it all, man. I love these studies for some reason. They're very iconic. Just showing the facade, you know, and it's tougher mm -hmm. to design something with zero dimension and divide up the space in a way that excites the eye with very little form. So, yeah, I feel like you have to go. You're great. And I see a little bit more of a, do you know Mike Magnola by chance? Mike Magnola, uh, if, if like I could, could be solid, probably I, I know. And then it just like, uh, I'm bad at names. <laughs> well, check him out, you know, Google him because it's, it is a more comic book approach, right? But yeah, Mike yeah. Magnola is kind of known for and I would say Erte and oh, yes. Beardsley, a lot of these people Beardsley, have yeah. mastered not only making things graphic, but relegating uh, form shadow, for example, to a single black shape. Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah. Your beautiful stuff. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Move on. Take care. You too. Unless you have any questions. Do you have any questions for me? Uh uh yeah but like like a lot but uh, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> oh no I, I mean like i have uh, like more updates but um i'll, I'll save time for others um okay. yeah, yeah i mean I if there's a question that, that would be relevant or helpful to others feel free to ask otherwise we'll talk soon yes yeah i'll, I'll, I'll save for others okay thank you yeah. bye bye and is ji young available ji young Choi. Bruce? I don't see him uh, as, as soon as his microphone turns on, he pops at the top of the list, and I do not see him. Okay, I'm just oh, going to go not, ahead. Yeah, I don't see this person in the list today. Okay, well, you know, should I go ahead and do, I don't care either way. It's beautiful work. I could just comment on it really quickly. What are you Sure, we have a couple more questions we can take after you, Critic, as, as work. Well, I, I'm just going to let everybody enjoy it. I think it's pretty stellar. I happen to love Paris, so I'm a sucker. <laughs> I don't know, just really quickly, obviously beautiful warm cool relationships, great painter. This is, uh, use this kind of broken color. In animation, there's a concept of color wipes, we called them. So we all know the pointillists were masters at, instead of just doing green, you use pointillism and your blues and your yellows blend and from a distance they say green, right? So what better for Monet's gardens than to use pointillism? But it, that's called optical blending, if that makes sense. In animation, if you want it to be perceptible from a distance, it's a larger color wipe we're talking about. So in Hunchback, you know, all those walls, we wanted them to be, you know, gritty and just aged with patina, with, you know, moss, exposed plaster, years of, you know, layers, uh, oxidization, rust, all of that. And so Lisa Keen, the background supervisor, would talk about color wipes. If you can't perceive it from a distance because the optical blending is on too small of a scale, it's not really going to bring anything to the composition. So this would be a great example of beautiful, warm, cool relationships you can see that the optical blending is happening on a rather microscopic scale. Love this. I'm guessing that's Les Tuileries. I wish he was here. I think that's Les Tuileries. That's the thinker, right? But uh, same thing, beautiful, warm, cooler relationships. Really quickly on this one, there's an artist called, um, and you probably know him, Tyler Carter, who's one of the Vizde of artists at Blue Sky. And I actually stepped in and subbed for his online class at one point for CG Academy called Light and Color. And so I watched his version of it in order to prepare to sub. And it was basically like taking the entire class myself. And I love the way he put it that, you know, we always talk about muddiness. You often hear it called um, chalkiness in a painting. And his way around that is 
the reminder, and I cannot disagree, it, it meant so much to me to hear this. It might seem obvious, but he says, assign a local color to everything and know what that local color is. That might seem obvious, but I'm not particularly good at it. I, you know, I'm so concerned with that broken color we talked about, or just kind of having every color everywhere so that there's harmony, that I kind of forget to allow things to own their local color and that alone creates unity within the shape. The second thing he says to avoid chalkiness or muddiness is correlate your light and shadow always with a warm cool relationship. So hopefully you can see the unity that creates here. Not only does it ring true as you know lighting that we recognize from planet earth, but it makes for a lot of unity. Anyway, great layouts. I'm sure, I wish he was here, but I'm sure he was influenced by Chomet. What were those, my favorite, The Illusionist, but what was the one before that? Oh, The Triplets of Belleville, if anyone's seen that. Love the French sensibility, and it's in every aspect of this design. I mean, you could almost say Art Nouveau, and that's redundant because even the little <coughs> subway, all the metro signs are Art Nouveau in Paris, not to mention the doors and all the decor set on top of the French provincial architecture. Love these studies for some of the reasons we mentioned earlier. Strong, you know, strong graphic design sense. If you can break something up in a way that excites the eye with zero dimension, you're ahead of the game. And again, you know, it's worth talking about. The presentation supports the content. So the design sensibility, the motifs in the presentation, one, it's a seamless experience we're having. <sighs> Amazing. Yeah, I, oh, and here's an example. Like, I think that's just enough reference that you're not squandering valuable real estate, nor are you overwhelming the work itself. That's a really nice use of sort of compositing reference. In a great way, you know, show your call outs, but doesn't overwhelm the work, nor is it taking up too much valuable real estate. And that that's just the right amount of description, in my opinion, since that question came up. It's not too much, but it sort of lets people in on your thought process, your conceptual process. Great turnaround. I don't know, maybe there's a conversation about like, if you're gonna do an asset, like a prop vehicle weapon, do the same approach every time, show your turnaround every time. Uh, consistent, you know, so the portfolio, just like any painting, you can think of all the concerns you would in a painting. Sort of rhythm versus symmetry in your repetition. So there's this idea in design that repetition plays a valuable role because it allows the variation to stand out. So if you're trying to create a focal point and the moon is the focal point, the repetition of all those triangles that are little pine trees is uh, so valuable so that the differentiating shape, the circle that is the moon can stand out. So repetition in a portfolio is actually a good thing because then you can be in control of those focal points that you choose to emphasize. Love that. Okay, I've got a P frankly. <laughs> um, so I, we got through three of them. I think that's good. I kind of wish GU was here, G Young was here. But uh, anyway, I hope that was valuable to everybody. And um, thanks for coming. Very good, very good, Dominic. I'm sure that the 380 people that saw this video, nice. this presentation is now clapping in silence. You did a great wow. job. Clapping in silence, what does that look like? It will be, <laughs> there you go. Times 380, please. Um, yeah, wow. This session was recorded and will be able to be played back later on. Uh, contact ctnlive.com and, and uh, you'll be able to find out when. It probably might be a couple days to a week or so. Great. Good to know. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Take care, right. everyone in Zoom land. Thanks, Alicia. Oh, we're done. <laughs>